Uh, we've been walking through the book of Ephesians, and officially we're in chapter 2, <clears throat> in uh, verses 5, 6, well really 4, 5, 6, and 7. And uh, so if you have your Bibles, chapter 2, 4, 5, 6, and 7. And uh, as I've been studying verses 6 and 7, uh, just the last couple of days, I've had to pull back and almost see what is going on from more of a global perspective. And uh, this whole last couple of weeks, I've been, pre uh, I've been preaching this earlier section in Ephesians, verses 15, uh, down to the end of the chapter. And it's been very fascinating to me as I've been studying chapter 2 to go back and be preaching chapter 1. And as I've been doing this, it's just been, I'm just starting to see some connectivity that I just had never seen before. And uh, we often joke about the people who preach here that, you know, we only actually have about 10 minutes of actually new content, and uh, the rest of the 40 or 50 minutes that we preach is just a rehashing of all that's going on, and then we give you the 10 minutes of nuggets, and then the next week we give you another 40-minute review, and that's not true, uh, but that's usually the uh, misunderstanding of what's going on up here. Sounds like we just always say the same thing. However, tonight, <clears throat> as, I've been, as I've been pondering uh, this passage in verse 6, I thought... The only way I can do this justice is if I go back. And not just go back, but I mean like go back, go back. And not just like back, back, but like to the very beginning of the book. And I know what you're all thinking. Oh, my goodness, how long are we going to be here? Uh, so my text this evening officially is Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, down through chapter 2, verse 6. Now, don't be concerned. Don't be concerned. Uh, we're actually going to land on verse 6. But what I want to do is I want to spend the majority of this evening doing a review. And the, uh, my reasoning is uh, not because I don't think any of you were listening the first time. Though that may have been true. Uh, the reasoning is I, I realized this last week it has been over a year since we've been in chapter 1, uh, verses 15 down to verse 23. And it's been probably two or three years, if you guys are even around, so the three people who were here, that we've been in verses 3 through 14. As I've been looking at verse 6, there's a flow that Paul is doing to get up to verse 6. And this whole last week, God was just like, you've got to see this in this perspective. So I would like to walk through. Don't, don't freak out. Don't throw rocks yet. But I would like to walk through all of chapter 1, the beginning of chapter 2, falling into verse 6. And this will go fairly quickly. I'm not going to come not going to preach every single verse. We're just going to highlight every verse. Is everyone okay? <clears throat> so if you haven't been with us, this is your overview of the book of Ephesians, chapter 1 and part of chapter 2. So if you have your Bibles, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, what Paul does throughout his book of Ephesians, he splits Ephesians into two sections. Uh, chapters 1 through 3 is the theology, it's the doctrine, it's the philosophy section. And verses 4 through 6 is the working out of that. Uh, the mindset that I've been working with is, in chapters 1 through 3, the big deal that Paul is saying over and over and over again is there's one thing about your life. If you are a Christian, there's one thing going on. If you wanted to be defined as a believer, this one thing has to be critical. This is what it means to be a Christian. Chapters 1 through 3. And that one deal is being seated in Christ. That's the term that Paul uses over and over and over. Is that you don't have a position outside of being sat down right smack dab in the middle of Jesus. That our position as believers is sitting in Christ. Meaning, here's Jesus, and I'm just plopped down in the middle of him, and he's surrounding me, he's in me, I'm in him, and there's just this collaboration of just this unity and this oneness between the two of us. And Paul walks through chapters 1 through 3 and outlines what that looks like in the life of a believer. And then chapters 4 through 6, he says, if this is what the life of a believer looks like, the theological content, let me give you some practicality of how that is lived out in your world so 4 through 6 is the living out, the, the walking about, if you will, of the 1 through 3 sitting in Jesus. So the illustration that I often use is the electric wheelchair. You have this wheelchair, and you're seated in the wheelchair. You're not to give up from the wheelchair. Your position is the wheelchair. You're never to get up. You're to stay planted in the wheelchair. What I say? You're sitting in the wheelchair, right? You're plopped down. You're sitting, sitting, like you're sitting in Christ. But yet, as you're sitting in Christ... It's not that you're doing nothing. It's not that you're sitting on a couch eating bonbons. It's there's a movement in the midst of seat, being sat. Is that the grammar term? Being sat in Christ. 
That doesn't sound right. Seated. <laughs> Whatever. <clears throat> so as you're seated in Christ, oh my God, I got all these English people going, oh, my ears. Uh, as you're seated in Christ, there's a movement forward. So it's like an electric wheelchair. You're seated in the electric wheelchair, but as you're seated, there is a progression, there's a movement forward, and there's a practicality of you living that out. That's chapters 4 through 6. So in chapter 1, verses 3 down to verse 14, this is the blessing section. And Paul just goes over, over, overboard and what it means to be in him. In fact, the ver verse 3 down to verse 14, that term in him is used over and over and over again. Why? It's as if he just doesn't think we're going to get it. And he says, your position is smack dab right in the middle of Jesus. Don't move from it. And so what he begins to do, he, said, uh, he breaks this down. So uh, verse 3 down to verse 6 is the blessings that we have in God the Father. Verse 7 down to verse 12 is the blessings that we have in the Son. And verses 13 and 14 are the blessings we have in the Holy Spirit. But do you know what is so fascinating about this blessing section? Every single blessing that we have is contained in the person of Jesus. So it doesn't matter if the blessing's coming from the Father. It doesn't matter if the blessing's coming from the Son. It doesn't matter if the blessing's from the Spirit. They're all focused in on the person of Jesus. And you begin to see that all throughout this thing. Uh, we're predestined. We're adopted. Uh, we've been uh, redeemed and forgiven. Hey, we have this inheritance. We have, hey, there's just this movement. And what do each of those aspects involve? Oh, it's Jesus in your life. Which tells you one thing. That everything that God has for you is centered and found in the person of Jesus. Meaning God does not hand you things outside of Jesus. He gives you Jesus, which becomes everything that you need. So you go to God saying, God, I just have to have a blessing in my life. He does not go, oh, let me hand you a blessing as if it's apart from him. He says, I'm going to hand you Jesus, who becomes the blessing in your life. So when you look at your life and you say, oh, I've just got all these blessings from God in my life, it's Jesus. And, uh, you know, we... If you've been around our group at all, you've heard this, this illustration, and we talk about like the fruits of the Spirit, and we say, oh, God, I need love. God does not go into the back counter, get this cookie jar called love, find this little piece of love, or like as a cookie or a pill, hand you this pill called love, and you pop it, and you go about your day, and you realize halfway through your day, you know, it wasn't love that I needed at all, it was patience, and you need to run back to God saying, God, I need patience right now, right, right now. And he goes back to the cookie jar, pops another pill, and you take patience. That's not what God does. So you walk up to God, and you go, God, I need love. And he goes, oh, I have the answer for you. Here's Jesus. Funk. And Jesus becomes your love. Go, oh, God, I need patience right now. Here's Jesus. Funk. And Jesus becomes your patience. In fact, when you go out the door and you realize that you didn't need patience at all, you needed peace, Jesus is still the answer. Because he is your love, he's your joy, he's your peace, he's your patience, he's your kindness, he's your goodness, he's your faithfulness, he's your gentleness, he's your self-control. He is everything that you need in life. In fact, Peter, in 2 Peter, says everything that you need for life and godliness is found in him. What do you need outside of life and godliness? Can't think of anything. So everything you need is found in Jesus. Does that make sense? And Paul is so strong on that in verses 3 through 14. I want you to get the flow. <clears throat> so 3 through 14 is, you have blessings in your life. In fact, you can't hold back the blessings. God is just overwhelmingly blessing you, blessing you, blessing you in Jesus. So if you just get tight with Jesus, do you know what happens in your life? Oh, blessing. Found in him. Now, we get into verse 15. And he says, oh, I just pronounced all this blessing. Hey, we're talking about all this blessing. I'm going to give you a prayer. Let me just pray for you. And I don't know about you, but there, there are people that I would love to just, I wish I could have been around to hear people pray. Just these epic saints of God pray. Oh. Uh, for example, uh, we have Ian Bounds. He wrote all these books on prayer uh, during the uh, Civil War time. And if you go to his house today, you can go up to his bedroom, and he had wood floors. And right next to where the bed was, there's these two huge grooves that his knees literally worn out the floorboards from where his knees would be praying every single day. Could you imagine what that would do to your knees? 
I mean, if that does it to the floorboards, could you imagine what your knees are like? So here's Ian Bounds just praying and wrestling with God. I would love to have heard him pray. Uh, A.W. Tozer, a great man of God from 19th century, and they said that, you know, people would like to sneak into his office because he would lay prostrate a lot during the week just praying and crying out to God, oh, would you just give a movement of God? Will you just give me clarity for the sermon? Will you just move upon this city? And Could you just imagine what it would like to be pray with A.W. Tozer? There's a man by the name of John Hyde. They called him John Praying Hyde. That was his name, John Praying Hyde. Praying Hyde, just for short. Missionary in India, and I've told this before, but uh, he would pray for days without stopping. He went, he went stop to eat. He'd be in the middle of this big revival service, and they go, where's John Hyde? Oh, he's in the tent praying. There was a time where he just prayed for like two solid weeks, night and day, praying. I don't know how your body can do it, but he just prayed for two weeks. And uh, one day this man walks up to him and goes, John Hyde, can I just, I, just, just for, give me just a few minutes of your time. Can I just come in and just listen to you pray? I just, I just want to be there as you talk to God. And John Hyde said, yeah, sure, why don't you come in? So they get there and they get on their knees. And the man said that they just sat there and they waited and they waited and they waited. He goes, it felt like it was forever. He goes, and maybe I just thought, well, maybe John Hyde's waiting for me to start. And so the, so the man's about to, like, take this breath and say, oh, Jesus, we come before you, and da, da 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 And he says, as he took a breath, John Hyde just went, oh, God. And he said that those two words, it's like it just split open the entire room. And he goes, we were literally elevated into the heavenly throne room itself. He's like, it was so intense. He goes, it just, you could just, there was a different smell. There was just, oh, there's an atmosphere. And John Hyde just began to pour out his heart. He goes, after about 20 minutes, we heard this on the door, and his thought was, how rude for you to interrupt. John Hyde is praying. We're in the throne room of God itself. How could you come barging in? And this man eventually opens the door and goes, uh, John Hyde, uh, you've been in here for about four hours. You're about to speak in ten minutes. Uh, you may need to get ready. He goes, four hours? He goes, I swear it wasn't any more than 20 minutes. But there was such an intense movement of God's presence that four hours felt like 20 minutes. Could you imagine hearing John Hyde pray? I would have loved it. Could you imagine being on the mountainside with Jesus overnight as he was communing with the Father? Do you know what the whispers of love they must have had between each other? Have you just ever pondered that? I would just love to have been hiding behind this bush and just listening to the prayer of Jesus with his Father. Uh, Paul is another one of those kind of guys. I mean, could you imagine you're, you've been beaten, your head's been caved in because they've stoned you, uh, your back is completely bleed, bleeding, and just, I mean, you've gotten the 39 lashes four times, five times, and you're just beaten, and you're just bruised up, and you just look like a mess, and they have you in stocks in, the, in this dungeon, which is in the very pit of the pits, and it's like all the sewer water just comes to your little cell, and, and the midst of that, you just start praying and just worshiping, and could you imagine hearing Paul pray in that? and the relationship and the intimacy that he must have had with God, oh, I would have loved to hear him pray. Do you know what we have here? Paul says, I'm only cracking my heart open, and I'm giving you an insight into my little prayer life for you, those in Ephesus. Which, by the way, is the same prayer life, or the same prayer that is being prayed on our behalf. So what is going on in this passage is literally to be going on in our life as well. So you want to hear Paul's prayer? Sure you do. In verse 15 and 16 of Ephesians chapter 1, Paul gives the introduction to the prayer. He says, Therefore I also, after I heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, making mention of you in my prayers. Paul says, I have heard of two things in your life. I have heard of your overwhelming faith in Jesus, and I have heard of your love for all the believers. Now again, faith, and you all know this, but faith is not some mere mental ascent. It's not mere belief. It's, I'm only throwing my entirety in on Jesus. I, I'm living a life of such a dependency that it's either him and he's going to move my life or I'm going to die. It's the idea of, here's this airplane, and I'm going to run out of the airplane, and I'm going to trust and have faith in my parachute. If the parachute doesn't open up, then we have a problem. Okay? And so you're literally throwing yourself out of an airplane. You're holding on to Jesus, saying, Jesus, you either got to come through in my life or we're not going to make it. 
And the terminology we keep using around here is invoking the activity of the second party. It's this idea of you look at Jesus and you say, Jesus, I literally cannot live the life that I'm supposed to live. I cannot do the things that you're calling me to do. I literally, I cannot perform what I'm supposed to perform. So I'm really asking, I'm begging, I'm inviting you into my day. I'm inviting you into this moment so that you can really produce something in me that I can't pull off on my own. Faith. And Paul says, I've heard that you are people of faith. You've literally put all your eggs in one basket. You're jumping out of the airplane. Jesus is your big deal. If he doesn't come through, then you're just going to crash. And out of this flow and this attitude of faith, something is coming out of that. Paul says it's this love of God, not just this love as if it's like some abstraction from God, literally the nature of God himself is agape love. It's the, hey, you can spit in my face, put a crown of thorns on my head, you can beat me up, you can nail me to a cross, but I'm just still going to love you despite what you do to me. I'm only going to reach my arms around you and just love on you, and you can't do anything about it. Just try. It's that kind of love. And Paul says, what's going on in you is you have such a faith and a dependency upon Jesus that he's really flowing his nature out of your life, reaching itself around your world and grabbing the people around you and is sucking them into who he is. And he says, I've heard that you are people like that. Oh, can I tell you, I want to be known. I want this church to be known as a people like that. That anybody who just happens across any of us, we're going through Walmart, we're going through the drive-thru at McDonald's, they just stop in here for a dinner. Somehow there is such a flow and an attitude of faith and dependency and surrender in our lives that it just really is producing this nature of God that he's just like pouring himself and oozing out of every pore of our bodies that's just reaching, he's reaching his arms out through our life, grabbing our world and sucking him into himself. So we don't care if they come to our church, but oh, if they could just get a hold of Jesus. We want that. And could you imagine what would happen to our community if, if this place was known for their absolute surrender, faith, and dependency upon Jesus and their love for everyone around them? Oh, we would turn this... We, we turn the town upside down. Not because we're doing anything, not because we're producing anything, but because he is moving in our midst. And again, it's not about our church, it's not about our numbers, but oh, to be so wrapped up in Jesus that he would have access to do what he wants through our life in and the midst of our community. Now that's the introduction of 15 and 16. He starts the prayer itself in verse 17. And he says, oh, I pray that God would give you this spirit of wisdom and revelation and the knowledge of him. This idea of revelation, again, is this idea of veiling. Uh, you have this huge curtain on a stage. Say we're at a theater. And there's this huge curtain, and it's hiding something behind it. And suddenly, at the right moment, the curtain is pulled back, and there's an unveiling of something. And whatever was behind is now revealed. It's the idea of revelation. That's what the word means. So you have this unveiling. The curtains have been pulled back, and there's this revelation What's being revealed? The wisdom of God, which literally means the deep things of God. So this is not just mere intellect of God. This is the deep things of who he is. So Paul's saying, I'm, I'm begging, I'm praying that there would just be this unveiling, the curtains would be pulled back, and there would be this revelation of the deep things of God in your life. Oh, I need that tonight. I don't know about you, but there are situations, there are circumstances, there are people that I just... I need God to come into my life and pull back the curtains of who he is to reveal the depth of himself and my life so that he can be the answer and the solution to my every need, problem, and circumstance. I have to have that tonight. I need it. But what is the whole purpose of the... Paul says it's for the purpose of knowing him. And again, knowing him is not facts and information. It's not two plus two equals four kind of knowledge. It's the word gnosko, which is the intimacy, it's the relationship, it's the oneness idea, it's the getting married and knowing your spouse kind of an idea. That the whole reason that God is wanting to literally come into our lives and pull back the curtains and reveal himself and the deep things of who he is is so that we can get lost in this relationship and this knowledge of him and me and just, I would know him, not in facts and information, not just knowing about Jesus, but I would know him as a spouse knows the other. <clears throat> In verses 18 and 19, Paul gets into the heart of the prayer itself, and he says, I'm praying three specific things, three core things in your life. Uh, look at them, verse 18. 
I pray that you would know the hope of his calling, the riches of the glory of his inheritance, and what is the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. And uh, we walked through this about a year ago. But the idea of your hope of the calling, it's not that we have a hope, it's not that we hope that we have a calling, it's that we have a calling which then produces the hope. So if you're feeling hopeless in life, let me tell you, you have a calling. And the fact that you have a calling should produce hope. Okay? Well, what is my calling? I'm called to be a plumber. No, that's not what we're talking about. I'm called to be a teacher. That's not what we're talking about. I'm called to be a circus clown. Maybe, but that's not what we're talking about. Okay? What we're talking about with the word calling, literally the calling that God has for you in your life, is Jesus. That the calling that God has on each of our lives is Jesus himself. Well, how is that found? Well, in the word calling, there's two aspects to the word calling. One is the idea of giving a name, and the other idea is an invitation to a banquet. The idea of giving a name is not just, oh, I'm going to call you Bob instead of Joe now. It's the idea of a, I'm getting wrapped up in a relationship with you, and I'm going to give you a pet name. Uh, you look at your, you know, your boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever, your, if you're a girl, your boyfriend, if you're a boy, girlfriend, never mind. If you look at your significant other and you look, you just just gaze in their eyes. You're just like, oh. And you just start calling them things. And it's usually food. Oh, honey. <laughs> Cupcake. Oh. You, you do this too. I, I know. Uh, sweetie pie. Deer. I mean, so we, we have these... Yeah, that would that'd be a food one, too. Uh, babe. I mean, I mean, we have these cutesy names for each other, right? Well, why do we have the names? See, we don't do those with people we hate. We don't, we don't look at someone we absolutely hate and go, hey, well, I hate. Uh, I was <laughs> like, I got to find a good one. Hey, cupcake. See, we don't do that to people we hate. See, that, that comes out of the, see, there's something that stirs within us and just, I have to give you a special name. Why? Because you mean something in my life. I got a friend of mine who every, every close friendship that he has, he has nicknames for everybody. And you just walk up to him and you get a new nickname. It's like all the time you're getting new nicknames. Why? Because you mean something in his life and he's just trying to, it's a way to convey you mean something in my life. And so you look at the other person and say, hey, cupcake, hey, beauty, hey, babe, hey, darling, whatever you call each other. And you just, see, it's out of the love and that's the idea that Jesus is giving. That it's, it's not just, hey, I'm going to give you a new name. It's out of the love that I have, I'm going to call you something. And in the intimacy and the relationship that we have, I'm going to give you a special name. What's the special name? Oh, it's just one of love. And he gives us a name. In fact, the book of Revelation says that he has given you a name that nobody else knows. He literally has a special name for you that nobody else knows. Have you ever thought about that? And what would it look like if we got so wrapped up in Jesus that somehow we would hear him whisper our name? Not our name, but our special name. The name that he only has for us. I mean, I have a name that nobody else knows. That, that nobody else even has. And Jesus calls me that. And I want to get so tight with him that I can hear my name being whisper, whispered upon his lips. Oh, he has a calling in my life. He's given me a new name. And the other idea, the other aspect, is a call to a banquet. That he's literally calling you into a banquet. And, it, and again, the banquet idea is that status and, and performance and your position in society is all governed by where you sit in the banquet. If you get to sit near the head of the table, you're really important. If you get to sit way down at the end, you're not quite as important. And then where you sit is important, but also how much food you get is important. If you get a lot of food, then you're really, really important. If you just get a hot dog, well, thanks for coming. So do you know what Jesus does? He, he not only gives you a special name, he literally invites you into a banquet. He seats you in the very best seat. In fact, you're seated in his seat. Uh, the head of the table, you're seated in him, in fact. At the very best seat, and you get the choicest foods. And he says, oh, help yourself. In fact, the book of Song of Solomon says he's invited you into the banqueting table. He's put this banner over you, and on that banner is written the word love. You have a calling. Oh, what's my calling? Jesus is your calling. 
So it doesn't matter what your profession is, you have a calling. That really defines who you are. So if I'm a teacher, I just I don't go to school because I'm a teacher. I go to school because of Jesus. And yes, I teach, but I'm there because Jesus is my calling, and he's going to spill his life out of me. And yeah, sure, I'll teach too, but hey, that's not why I show up. I'm, a, I'm called to be a called to Jesus. I may be a circus clown. I may be a plumber. And the reason I go plumbing is not because I'm a plumber. It's because I get to spill Jesus all day. And yeah, yeah, I get to fix people's plumbing issues, but that's not why I do it. Why do I do it? Jesus is my calling. Which means that you can change your profession and you never change your calling. See, I, I, may, I may be a plumber this year and next year I may end up teaching and then the next year I become a circus clown, but my calling never changes. He is my calling. Does that make sense? Oh, you are called. And because he is your calling, you realize that that produces hope in your life. Exciting. Not only that, Paul says, but I pray... <clears throat> that you know the riches of the glory of his inheritance. And again, inheritance is not the have to wait to get to heaven. It's not the mansions in the sky, streets of gold, bonbons with no calories, eternal shuffleboard. It's not that idea. The idea of inheritance, guess what it is? Jesus. Jesus is your inheritance. Which means what? I don't have to wait to die to get my inheritance. In fact, I get to have my inheritance right this very moment. It's found in the person of Jesus. And you realize the only time I'm giving you permission tonight to be greedy. You can be greedy all you want. In fact, I'm going to encourage you to be greedy. And biblically, it's okay to be greedy in one thing. Okay, greed, greed is considered a sin, except in this one area. Jesus. You can be greedy in Jesus, and it's okay. Why? Because Jesus is really opened himself up wide, saying, take as much as you want. So why are you content with so little? If he's opening himself up wide, he's literally offering himself in his, in his entirety to you. Hey, if, if we took you into the back room and it's full of $100 bills, and we said you get one chance to come in and take as much as you want, and as soon as you walk out the door, that's all you get. I don't know about you, but I'd be sewing pockets everywhere. Why? I'm going to take as much as I can. And yet here's Jesus, and he says, I am absolutely limitless. Take as much as you want. And we just take a crumb and we say, thank you. That's all I want. Why would we do that? And if you look at the fruits of the Spirit again, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, the next line says, against such things, there is no law. Why? Because no one ever comes up to you and says, you know, you've been a little too patient today. Uh, will you get really ir irritated at me? See, no one says that. You know, you've been a little too peaceful. Just have a little anger. You're just a little loving. Uh, would you have more hatred in your life? See, no one says that. Why? There is no law against those things. And you realize the fruits of the Spirit are merely aspects of who Jesus is. And so here's Jesus opening himself up wide, saying, take as much of me as you want. In fact, would you go after me? Would you just commit to being hungry and thirsting after me? That for 24 hours a day, 365 days a year, for the rest of your life, I would be your big obsession. I would be your one drive. I would be your consuming. And you realize, at the end of your life, you still have not begun to even hit the top of the shaved ice off the very tippity top of the iceberg of who he is. In fact, in verse 14, it says we have an inheritance, and he is our down payment, which is what? You... He is our 10% deposit, meaning you could go after Jesus the entirety of your life, and at the end of your life, do you know what you've gotten? You've only gotten 10%. Now, it's a big 10%. I mean, it's phenomenal. I mean, I only probably have 2% right now, so I can't wait for the rest of my life. Oh, can you imagine? 10%. But 10%. Where do you get the other 90? Oh, up there. But man, you have an inheritance, and you can experience 10% right now. Would you embrace him? And he's literally opening himself up wide saying, help yourself. Take as much as you want. Why are you content with so little of me? You have an inheritance. Uh, the last thing he says in the prayer, verse 19, <coughs> is that he prays that you would know the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. 
And uh, the illustration that we were running with <coughs> excuse me, is the uh, droplet of water. If you were here, you remember the crazy, sort of stupid illustration of the alien coming down to Earth, looking at this tree, has a single droplet of water, and he asks, what is that? And you say, oh, it's water. And you're trying to describe water to someone who's never seen water before. And all they have to go on is a single droplet of water. And my question was, is how do you begin to describe the vastness of the ocean by a single droplet of water? How do you begin to wrap your mind, if you've never seen water, if you've had no comprehension of water, how do you begin to even have an understanding, an inkling of the vastness of an ocean, of whales and of fish and of, of jellyfish and sharks and coral reefs and huge ton, 100,000 ton, 100, ton ship that floats on it? How do you begin to understand that when all you've ever seen is a single droplet of water? And I would say you probably can't begin, even begin to wrap your mind around it. I mean, how would you understand the vastness of the ocean, if all you've ever seen and understood of water is a single droplet. And I would like to propose in that same understanding, all that we have in terms of who God is is but a single droplet of water. And yes, it's a big droplet of water. I mean, we have the entirety, in the entire revelation of Scripture. We have all of history. We have all of creation. But yet, if you were to package that, it's but a single droplet of water compared to who he is. And so how do you begin to describe who God is when all we have is but a single drop of water compared to the vastness of the ocean of who he is? And could you imagine going through all eternity going, there's a whale! I never could even fathom a whale. Why? All I've had was a single drop of water. And could you imagine at the end of, say, 10 billion trillion years, and God goes, I just want to let you know that all that you've just discovered in these 10 billion trillion years is but a single drop of water compared to who I am. And he begins to have more of a revelation to us throughout. I mean, could you imagine? I'm excited for eternity. We're in eternity, but I'm excited for it to go on. Ah. And what Paul says is just as it is impossible to describe the vastness of the ocean by a single drop of the water, so too is the power of God indescribable with what we have. And so Paul uses two rare Greek words he uses the word exceeding greatness. He says God's power is exceedingly great. Not just great, exceedingly, overwhelmingly, immeasurably great. That's the power of our God. I can't describe it. So I'll use these two rare words. Now he goes in and he attempts to describe the power in verse 19. He says, I'm going to give you four words for the word power. The one word for the word power is this idea that God has this place of sovereignty, control, and authority. That you can't ever back him up against the wall. He has this absolute state of I'm in control. God has that. Not only does he have that, but he has an ultimate resource. It's that whoa, that resource, the power, the ability. It's the Sean Patrick can bench press 55 pounds. It's that whoa. Right? Now he's not doing anything. He just he has the ability. Now when he walks over into the bench press and he bench presses the 55 pounds, let's say 50 pounds. Okay? When he bench presses at 50 pounds, sorry. When he bench presses at 50 pounds, that's the word dunamis. It's the word dynamite, dynamite in our language. So here's, here's God, and he says he has an ultimate, whoa. Okay, he, he can do anything he wants. He has, he has resource. He has ability. He has power. And he's really flowing. He's energizing that power into our lives, creating this explosion. That's the description of God's power. And you walk up to Paul and you say, Paul, I understand that, but practically, what does that look like? What does it mean for God to have a whoa, go in and... <laughs> Paul goes, I'm glad you asked. I want to give you two illustrations that describes the whoa, go in, <laughs> in your life. Okay? And he says the first illustration is Jesus. Jesus is the demonstration of the whoa, go in, <laughs> in someone's life. All right? You need me to do it again? Yeah. Everyone okay? <laughs> So when you, ask, when you go up to Paul and you say, I don't understand what this looks like, he says, look at the life of Jesus. And Je what was going on in Jesus? Jesus becomes a demonstration of the power of God. He is really the explosion. He's the dynamite of, the, of God. I, I know I didn't do the sound effects. It's okay. He said, the other illustration I'm going to give you, not just Jesus, but you 
are a picture of the, you are a demonstration. You are an explosion of the dynamite of God. You are a picture showing forth the law of God. Okay? So he sets up these two pictures. And throughout these two pictures, there are, it's just really a parallel. Here's Jesus. Here's you. Here's Jesus. Here's you. And all that's going on in Jesus' life is also going on in your life. Okay? So get this. Uh, really quick. Verses 29 to verse 23. <clears throat> he says, this power, this wonk, going and creating this, what does that look like? Well, he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated Jesus at the right hand in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And he put all things underneath his feet, and gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. What was going on in the life of Jesus? Here's Jesus, deader than a doornail, pushing up daisies. He's food for worms. He's dead. It's as if we walked into the morgue and we saw this embalmed body. Okay, it's not going to get up. It's deader than a doornail. It is dead. Right? Dead. And Godly reaches into this physical death of Jesus and he yanks him from death into life. That, in my mind, would be an incredible demonstration of the power of God. But it doesn't stop there. He takes Jesus in from life and he yanks him and pulls him into the heavenly places and gives him a position at the right hand of the Father. This position is far above all power and authority that you can name, whether spiritual or physical. And then he takes everything and plops them down underneath the feet of Jesus. He puts the foot of Jesus on the neck of his enemies. So everything comes beneath him. He gives him a name that is above every other name. And then it says that, we be, that he becomes the head of the body, which is us, the church. That is a demonstration of the power of God in the life of Jesus. Now he turns in chapter 2 and says, let me paint this picture of you. You are a demonstration of this power, this wah, flowing into your world, creating this so we are the of God's womb. Right? Very okay, good. In verses 1 through 3, Paul says, let me describe what you were. Not who you are, but what you were. Well, what were you? You were in this life of sin. Your whole mindset was that of the world. You're literally polluted. You're just thinking. You're scheming ways to live in sin. And you're just, there's this attitude of sin boiling forth. And you are deader than a doornail spiritually. Just as Jesus was dead physically, so you are dead spiritually. Just as God had to reach into a morgue, into this embalmed body, and he yanked that into life, so he has to come into my deadness, into my embalmed spirituality, and he yanked me from death into life. So the, the, the exceeding trouble, or maybe the problem that we had put God into, we literally, we gave him a hard problem. Because we have a whole bunch of dead people spiritually, that God now has to enliven. And this is not, well, he's sort of dead, so we're going to bring him back to life. This is deader than a doornail dead. And God's literally reaching into death itself and yanking people into life. And just as he reached into physical death and yanked Jesus into physical life, so he reaches into our spiritual deadness and yanks us from spiritual death into spiritual life. Which is incredible. Then just as... He yanked Jesus from spiritual life and brought him into the heavenly realms and sat him at the right hand of the Father and put all things underneath his feet. Guess what he does to us? He takes us from spiritual life, brings us into the spiritual realms, heavenly realms, seats us in Christ at the right hand of the Father, puts all things underneath our feet. Isn't that incredible? And so all that was going on in Jesus is now to be going on in us. Do you see that? And Paul has this incredible parallel of, hey, look at the life of Jesus and all that God was doing in the physical life of Jesus. So now he wants to do it in the spiritual life of humanity, which I just think is phenomenal. Now, <clears throat> really quick, look at verse 6. And uh, this won't be very long. But in verse 6, <coughs> let me read verse 5. Well, let me start with verse 4. In fact, let me start with verse 1. Just kidding. Verse 4. We just got through the whole death, 
You're in death and sin and all this kind of stuff. Verse 4. But God, who is rich in mercy, thank you, Jesus, because of his great love with which he's loved us. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Even while we were dead in trespasses, deader than a doornail, he reached in and made us alive together with Christ. For by grace you have been saved. And he raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Uh, verse 6 again. And raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, I'm not going to steal my thunder because we're actually going to dive into the verse tomorrow, tomorrow morning. But can I point out something that I found so, oh, so neat? There are three words that Paul uses to describe what God has done in our life. Look at this. Verse 5, he says, he's made you alive together with Christ. Verse 6, he's raised us up with Christ. And the end of verse 6, he's made us sit together in Christ. If you look at all three of those words in the Greek, there's a prefix attached to every single one of them. Now, when you look at the word itself, it's the exact same word used to describe Jesus. So here's Jesus, and God raises him in, into life. That's this word. Then he raises him, and then he sits him. It's the same word used here. But in our case... When he describes humanity, there's a prefix attached to him, to all three of the words. Not only that, they're all indicative, which means they're simple statements of fact, meaning you don't have to question it. It's just, there's a simple statement. This is how it is. If you are a Christian, this is what it means. Simple statements of fact. Do you know what the prefix is on every single, the, the three words here? On each of these words. The prefix is the word soon, S-U-N. And it means with. Which is why we have this translation in verse 5, that while we were dead in trespasses, he made us alive together with Christ. Okay? That's that word, with. Verse 6, he raised us up together, or with Christ. Uh, later on, he made us sit together. See, this is not God reaches into our lives and making us alive. This is not him reaching into our life and raising us up. This is not God reaching into our lives and sitting, s seating us. He's not doing that. Everything he's doing in our life, he's doing it in and through Jesus, which is the whole flow of what he's been saying all throughout the entirety of the book. Every blessing that we have is found in So nothing that God gives us is outside of him. He says, do you know what I'm going to pray for you in your life? Every single thing I'm going to be praying for you is focused on Jesus. Hey, why would I pray anything else in your life? If all that you need in your life is Jesus, and he's the answer and the solution to everything in your life, why would I pray anything else for you? Why would I not, not just pray that you get wrapped up into him, that, let, that you would just allow him to be your calling, your inheritance, that, that, that you would be the demonstration of his power? Because it's all about him. Oh, you get wrapped up in intimacy. Oh, that you would just, it's all about him. And here, Paul goes, hey, God's been doing this stir. He's only moved us from death into life. And I've been looking at that going, woo, thank you, Jesus, for reaching into my life and causing that to happen. That's been my mindset. And God goes, no, 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 no. I have not reached into your life. I have not done that. Yeah, I mean, yes. But it's not like, well, Nathan's so special, I'm going to just... Okay? He hasn't done that. He's literally said, in the person of Jesus, I'm going to take Nathan and plunge him into the death of Jesus. I'm going to bring him into the life of Jesus. I'm going to raise him into the heavenly realms in Jesus. I'm going to set him down in Jesus. In fact, everything I'm going to do in Nathan's life is going to be because, by, and through Jesus. Does that make sense? God is not going to do anything in my life that's not through Jesus. Jesus is going to be the avenue through which he moves upon my life. Jesus is going to be the content and the very essence of what he's going to be doing in my life. It's all wrapped up in Jesus. So when it says that he's made us alive, he's made us alive in or with Jesus. Which we're going to look at in a, in a, in a later study. It's the whole Romans 6 idea. That when, that when Jesus died, we died with him. 
Well, how that happened? That was 2,000 years ago. I know. But just as he died, so we died. Just as he rose to life, so we're raised to life. How's that happen? There's this whole idea of reckoning, which we'll get into in in another study. But hey, just as Jesus went in, see, it's not that I went into death. Jesus went into death, and it was through his death that I found death. It was through his life that I found life. It's through him being raised to the right hand of the Father, being set at the right hand of the Father, seated at the right hand of the Father, that I do that. It's not that I have the special position that Jesus or God does it in my life. It's as I'm getting wrapped up in Jesus, it is through him that I find my position. Does that make sense? Which means I know Jesus. And really quick, a couple implications. If this is true... Then you realize, and I've already said this, but God is going to do nothing in my life that is not done in and through Jesus. That, hey, when God wants to move upon my life, how's he going to do it? Jesus. Hey, when he wants to change my inner attitude, how's he going to do it? Jesus. Hey, when he wants to turn me on my head, how's he going to do it? Jesus. I think that's exciting. And if I get wrapped up in Jesus, do you realize I don't have to worry or stress about God moving upon my life? He's going to move upon my life. Why? Because it's Jesus. And he refuses to leave me the same way I am. It's that whole idea of intimacy again. You can't stay intimate on the same level. It's impossible. You're either progressing or you're not. And so if I'm wrapped up in Jesus, he's going to be sucking me into something. He's He's going to move. He's going to change. He's going to transform. He has to do it. Why? Because it's Jesus. So if I'm not moving, I'm not changing, I'm not being transformed, why? It's not because I'm, it's because I'm not wrapped up in Jesus. Uh, and the second idea, or the second implication of this, is that if this is true, then our whole life has to be wrapped up in Jesus. Uh, that what was going on in Jesus is now to be going on in me. That the mindset, the nature, the attitude of Jesus is now to be happening in my life. And this is not, again, this is not a what would Jesus do mentality. This is not looking at the mindset and the attitude of Jesus saying, how can I perform this? This is allowing him to invade my life, to invade my mind, my attitude, my disposition, my personality, my temperament, my whatever. And he just begins to transform me into his perfect image. Philippians chapter 2, verse 5, it's that, it's that idea. He says, hey, have this mind in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The word their mind is not just your mind. It's your orientation. It's your makeup. It's your your everything. So, hey, as Jesus had this orientation, as he had this nature, as he had this flow, as he had this mindset and this attitude, that needs to be going on in me. How does that take place? I'm going to discipline myself and bite my lip. No. Get wrapped up in Jesus. And as you get wrapped up in him, His nature, his attitude, his flow, his just starts. All throughout Scripture, you get one idea. What is it? Christ and you. In fact, Colossians 1.27 says there's just been this, there's been a thing that's been going on since the very creation of time. And it's been hidden for ages and generations. But this mystery has now been revealed. What's been revealed? Christ in you. You, the hope of glory. Would you get all wrapped up in Jesus? And let he be in you and you be in him and just... Do you see the flow that Paul's been going from the very beginning? It is Jesus in your life. Would you embrace him? Uh, Would you just let him be the content and the definition of your life? Would you let him be the flow in your attitude? Not by performance, not by trying, not by striving, but by intimacy and being wrapped up in him. Pray with me. Jesus, oh Lord, I cannot pull off the Christian life. I, I cannot be good enough. I cannot strive hard enough. I cannot, cannot do and say all the right things. You, oh God, have got to come and infiltrate my life and be the very attitude and the essence of who I am. Lord, if every blessing that you have for my life is found in Jesus, and everything in prayer 
that I need for my every moment, life, and circumstance, and situation is found in Jesus, then, oh, may I get wrapped up in you. May somehow in my inner intimacy and my interaction and my oneness with you, that we would just have such a, oh, that there could be just this dynamic flowing between us that, hey, there's less and less of me and more and more of you, and you're just involved in my life, and my attitude's no longer my attitude, it's you, and my thought process is no longer tainted by the world, it's all you, and hey, the things that I speak is now the things of Jesus, and the things that I think about, and the, the, my emotions, and my personality, and my temperament, and my body drives, it's all just under the authority, and governed, and controlled, and only flowing forth because of Jesus. Lord, could you and I get so intimate and wrapped up with one another that you are the content, that you are the definition, that you are the substance, you are the flow, you are the only explanation for my life. Oh, could that be the case? Lord, would you so aggressively get a hold of me that there is no more of Nathan, it is only Jesus. That people lose sight of who I am, that people forget my name, that people just pass me by, that I'm just, hey, I'm just a nobody, but oh, it's you. That when they forget my name, the only thing that they can remember is Jesus, that when I spend five minutes with somebody, they completely forget I was there, and somehow they're just captured by you, and that all that's going on in my life is only defined by Jesus, that the only thing that's stirring in my heart, my mind, and my attitude is Jesus, the only thing that's pouring out of my life when someone just ticks me off is Jesus. That my calling, my inheritance, my flow, my blessing, that all of it's just contained in Jesus. Uh, heads are bowed. Do you have that in your life? Uh, is Jesus the content? Is he the definition? Is he the big deal? Is he the flow? Is he the excitement of your life? When people look at you, can they explain your life because of how good you are, or because of your talent, or because of your intellect, or your ability? Or is the only explanation for your life Jesus? That people are just mystified by who you are. They just say, I don't quite understand how you live the way you do. It must be Jesus. That's what it means to be a Christian that you and he are so wrapped up together that you're not performing it, you're not accomplishing it. It's him inside your life pulling it off. How does that take place? You get wrapped up in him. Are you tight with him? Could you get any tighter with him? Now we're just going to spend a couple of minutes just seeking and responding. Hey, there's nothing special about altars, but hey, for us, it's just a place to surrender. It's a place to say, hey, I'm going to be dependent upon Jesus. It's a place to just say, Jesus, I just need more of you. Would you be willing to get out of your seat? Hey, no one cares. Hey, don't let the pride just keep you in the seat. But why, why wouldn't you get up and just say, Jesus, oh, would you be the content? Would you be the definition? Would you be the only flow and explanation for my life? Can I just get wrapped up in you just deeper and more passionately, more intimately, that the only thing flowing in my life would be you? I need that tonight. And I'm going to get on my knees and just seek him. Why? Oh, I need him. I need to get all wrapped up in him closer with more passion and intimacy than I was yesterday. And tomorrow, oh, I'm going to have to do it again. Why? Because I need him more tomorrow than I even need him today. Would you seek and respond to him tonight? Would you fall in love with him anew and afresh? Would you let him be the flow and definition of who you are? A moment of seeking.